it all started with a very simple idea. Tell the stories of how successful middle market CEOs made it to the corner office. I'm Brand Handley, founder and managing director of Resource Options International, or ROI. We're the USA's premier executive search firm focused exclusively on empowering middle market companies to attract, hire, and retain A players while transforming top executives' careers and lives. ROI's Into the Corner office is dedicated to discovering how middle market CEOs advance their career, and we're making these remarkable and sometimes quite unbelievable stories available to you for the very first time. Listen and learn about the challenges they've overcome, the interesting people they've met along the way, and the lessons learned that steered these executives' unique journey into a middle market corner office of their own. I know you enjoy these CEO stories as much as I've enjoyed recording them. So thank you for listening today. And if you like what you've heard, rate us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm looking forward to you joining me on the next great middle market CEO adventure into the corner office. Today, my guest is Kevin Miller, president and chief executive officer of Travis Credit Union. Kevin brings more than 18 years of experience in the financial services industry and has held a variety of senior and executive roles within regional banks and most recently was the chief growth officer of a fintech focused on empowering the underserved consumer to improve their credit and financial well-being. He serves on the board of directors for the Solano Economic Development Corporation and Travis Credit Union Foundation and is on the advisory board for the Global Retail Marketing Association. Kevin holds a Master of Science in Integrated Marketing Communications from Northwestern University and a bachelor's degree from the University of South Florida. Kevin Miller, welcome into the corner office. Brent, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, great to have you here as well. And where do we find you uh, recording this podcast today? I am currently in uh, Vacaville, California, which is the headquarters of Travis Credit Union. Nice, nice. Now, how's the weather out in California today? We are in full fall effect. So for Northern <laughs> California, that's, uh, you know, 60s and beautiful and sunny. Got to love it. Got to love it. Well, let's t start with how we always start these podcasts and understanding a little bit about your early years. Uh, tell us where you grew up and what your early family life was like. Absolutely. That's my, my, my parents. Uh, and then I have an older brother who lives on the East Coast, spent my early childhood basically up until middle school in the outside of Boston, so in Massachusetts. And then we moved uh, middle school through undergrad to the Tampa Bay area in Florida. Nice, 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 nice transition between those two places. Uh, what did mom and dad do for a living? Uh, my dad worked in sales, but by education was an electrical engineer. Um, and then my mom worked as an administrator at the local school system. Got it. Cool. So an educator in the house. What were the, some of the things that you remember growing up? Any uh, specific moments or, you know, key influences that uh, you remember from mom and dad? Uh, both my parents have uh, an incredible sense of humor. Uh, they both wanted my brother and I to, you know, experience as much of life as possible before settling down. Um, and then my parents love adventure. So we we're always doing kind of weekend road trips and things like that to explore uh, whether we lived in New England or we lived in Florida. We were kind of always out and about checking out local events, you know, checking out new cities, all that fun stuff. Awesome. Awesome. What were some of the funner places you went to as a kid that you remember? Uh, my, my dad loves being around the water. So we spent, pardon me, a fair amount of time in small harbors. So we went to, did a bunch of trips to Cape Cod. Um, we uh, kind of bounced around up to Maine at times. Um, and then when we lived in Florida, I uh, went up to the Panhandle, uh, kind of bopped around. And then one holiday, we drove from Florida to Massachusetts wow. uh, to see family. And we went out to the Outer Banks on the way back. So we drove up for the holidays. On the way home, we explored the Outer Banks of the Carolinas, uh, took the ferry system. So kind of a really unique way to finish up your holiday season was the winter time in the Outer Banks, being on a ferry when it's, you know, 20 degrees outside. It's it's, it's a pretty <laughs> cool experience. Absolutely. A yeah, beautiful part of the country there. I had the opportunity to drive down in a cargo van from Connecticut down to North Palm Beach, Florida, where I'm living now, and uh, went through that beautiful area along Charleston, the Carolinas. It's just gorgeous. And you can never forget going up the corridor, everyone's famous favorite south of the border, which is a giant tourist <laughs> trap. Uh, it's that's, quite that's an experience, right. especially... Especially when you're a kid, it's like a big deal, you know, so it's like 100 miles in advance of south of the border. 
are signs and like every you know you keep getting closer and closer and there's more and more signs and so as a kid you, i just remember that being a very big landmark and the it takes about 24 hours of driving to get from where we lived in florida to the massachusetts area or new jersey and so i remember seeing those signs for miles and miles <laughs> during the journey <laughs> that's incredible yeah I've, I've gone by that a couple of times it's kind of a big amusement park right it is it's a, you know it's like a a giant, uh, you know, tourist location. They've got restaurants, they have a hotel, but they've got all sorts of games. And, um, you know, it's it's very vivid in colors. So it's like every neon version of a thing you could imagine there. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, I've always wondered about it. I haven't stopped. I'll have to do that someday. Maybe maybe when my kids come to visit or grandkids in that matter. There you so, go. So tell us about your school years. It's, you know, moving around a little bit. Were you able to keep your grades up? Was that important to you as you were growing up? Yeah, it's um so uh, early childhood. I got very fortunate uh, as a young young kid um, when we were living in New England. It was identified pretty early on that I had a little bit of a learning gap, and so they caught that uh, relatively early on. So I'm the byproduct of a kid with an IEP, which is for kids who needed some additional help, um, and that enabled me in my younger years to kind of figure out how I learn, and that took me a period of time. I would say I was a okay student. Um, it really wasn't until I got to college where I got focused. In college, I took very seriously, um, you know, I kind of had a dual major. I uh, majored in communication, minored in business, did a lot of work in leadership, um, and was just a, a really good learning. And is when I got serious about, hey, I'm on, you know, my dime, got to learn this, got to really uh, bunker down and kind of really be focused on learning. Whereas in my high school years, Loved it, was in, involved in every activity known to man, uh, you know, which was a lot of fun, great building friends, learning new skills. But at some point, you know, I think it became apparent to me that I really you know, needed to get more focused. <laughs> what were some of those things you enjoyed outside of class, Kevin? Um, so outside of class, um, in, in high school, we did a lot of work related to I was in I was in everything. So I was in student government. I was in band. I was in TV production the volunteer organization, you name it, I probably did it, which probably explained why I was a little distracted from my grades. Um, and then really when I got to college, um, it was all things, I was in a program focused around uh, kind of leadership development. And so that cohort of people for my time in undergrad, um, you spent a lot of time with those individuals. And so it's kind of a really unique way to learn about community and leadership. Uh, we actually all lived in the same dorm together. So it was a kind of an encompassing program uh, that actually no longer exists, but at the time was for me very transformative in kind of my development. Yeah. How about entrepreneurial things? In, in involved in any of those as a kid? Unless I was a little kid, um, but I started working or had a part time job at a relatively young age. Uh, so uh, along my journey, um, I was involved in got involved in community theater when we moved from Massachusetts to Florida. Um, and, you know, not so much on the acting side. It's not really my jam. Public speaking, I like, but acting, not so much. But I fell in love with the behind the scenes. Um, and so the community theater thing turned into, you know, being I couldn't drive yet, but I got to stage manage a show and I got to design lights for a show. And that you know, it was my first glimpse into, you know, being able to influence people, whether as a peer or way more junior than them, and then ultimately turned it into a job. So actually, I had a part time job starting in late middle school, early high school in community in theater. Um, and I worked in theater all the way until I, when I went to graduate school. So on the weekends, wow. I would go and work at a performing arts center uh, behind the scenes doing light design operations, kind of all that stuff. Um which is a great perspective because in any given day, you could be the janitor. So you could be mopping the floors. You could be greeting customers. You could be interacting with the those that are acting or performers. So it was a really good insight into uh, the, the interesting thing that theater or live shows teach you is, as the analogy goes, the show must go on. So no matter mm -hmm. what happened, there was an expected outcome. Uh, and I really liked the challenge of you never quite knew what was going to happen, uh, but the fact that Ultimately, there was still an end product. You were delivering something to a consumer. And I really, really love that environment and got exposed to uh, a, a wonderful boss, several of them who were really instrumental in kind of helping me kind of, you know, learn from them about different styles of leadership. Super cool. And did you ever feel the pull that that might be something you wanted to do professionally? I did. Uh, and then I realized I uh, probably, and as I was wrapping up college, I still worked part-time on the weekends at the theater or a couple of the theaters. 
And I realized that it was shifting from something I really enjoyed to more of it was turning into a job and I was less enthused about it. And so that was kind of the sign to me that I really wanted to move on to the next thing. And so, you know, kind of talking to my parents and family friends around what might be the path forward. And I think one of the things we all go through is I think in college, you, at least in my mind, imagine one day the the clouds would part and a, a ray of light would shine down and you would know what you wanted to be in life. And for me, that was not the case. <laughs> uh, so to me, it was a little bit of trial by error in terms of, so I did a lot of internships in college in the business arena, and that really kind of helped me. I learned more about what I didn't like, but it slowly got me to where I kind of, I think was the right place to be, but it was definitely a journey. I, I had a lot of ideas, but as you know, when you're going from your academic days, which is all in concept and theory to now you're in the environment, it's a very different experience. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you mentioned something that I think is so true. And I get a lot of requests in our recruiting business from CEOs that are my age or younger or older that have kids, you know, that are maybe 20, 30 years junior and starting out. And, you know, I tell them, you know, it's not really figuring out, you know, what you want to do right away. You know, that that cloud break, as you said, was what opens up and the sun shines down. It doesn't happen all that often. But figuring out the stuff you don't want to do is sometimes very important when you're young because you got a lot of time. Was that kind of your case as well? It was. I only know two people in my entire life uh, who knew what they wanted to do at a young age and do that today. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't change much. What was your uh, inspiration for college? Was that kind of something that you knew you needed to do? Mom and dad encouraged you to do, you know, kind of a foregone conclusion going through school? Yeah, interesting. Uh, one of my parents went to college, one did not. And I think what they wanted for their children, my brother and older brother and I, um, was really to continue your learning. Um, at the time, college was the most logical path. But had we said it isn't traditional for your college, it wanted to make sure that we took the time to develop ourselves before we settled down. And that was the really the big the big message our parents gave to my brother, whose name is Andrew and I, was really around before you, whether it's a spouse or a partner or whatever it is, before you settle down, figure out who you are. Um, because if you don't know that piece, it's really hard to be with somebody else. And so I think that was really wise advice for my brother and I. We both got married a bit further down our journey in life, and we got to spend more time career figuring out what we were, what we stood for. And I think ultimately when I look back, that was hugely helpful for myself. Now you went to USF, University of South Florida, and uh, I believe you studied communications. Is that right? Was that a, a, a wandering journey or did you go into that straight out uh, as a freshman or sophomore in school? It was a journey. Uh, and the journey was I took my first accounting class and I realized that perhaps accounting was not for me, but I love <laughs> the business aspect of things. And so I actually... You know, in a, in a bit of frustration and dismay, I went to the kind of counseling office, the career counseling office at the University of South Florida, and I had a mentor at the school as well. And I just talked about, you know, here's where I think my strengths are, uh, you know, what are those options? And so they kind of helped me map out different ways of attacking the same thing. So I ended up getting a major in communication, a minor uh, in business, and I got, I think, like a certificate in leadership. So it was a nice dimension of getting all of those elements, but I think what we all learn in life is ultimately you got to figure out how you do it your way. And sometimes your way of doing it isn't the traditional way. And that often is the case for me. Right. What was that first job you took out of college? Uh, first job out of college. So actually between undergrad, uh, I continued to work in theater um, and I actually applied to graduate school. And part of that had to do with the timing. Uh, when I graduated undergrad was during the famed dot-com bubble. Oh um, and there were not a lot of great jobs. Uh, so I continued to work in theater, uh, which helped pay the bills. Um, and I had a mentor for my undergrad. I had uh, two of them that were very instrumental. And, um, you know, the opportunity cost during this phase of your life is relatively low. And so uh, there was a recommendation that I check out uh, where I went to get my master's in integrated marketing communication. It was a very applied program. And I'm a very applied type of person. I applied, I got in and I went there. Um, and that's ultimately how I started my corporate career. So I shifted from my, you know, kind of middle school through undergrad kind of career in theater, did lots of business internships, but really my corporate career uh, started after graduate school. And who was that with? 
Um, I went to my undergrad, sorry, my graduate school was with, at Northwestern, and then I started my uh, financial services career with Bank of America. Ah, great company. But uh, I think by that time, they were already on the East Coast. Is that right? They'd moved from San Francisco to North Carolina? Correct. Yep. And so I was, uh, after graduate school, I moved to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where Bank of America is headquarters and spent uh, about six years with them. Yeah. Awesome. Did you get leadership responsibilities early on there, Kevin? I would say uh, I did over time. The big transition for me was learning the corporate world. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you know, and it's, a, as you know, so I came in through a graduate school program, right? So I had great training, less direct experience. And so that those first couple of years took me a while to get my bearing. So I wouldn't say it was probably until year maybe three, where I really felt like I had solid footing and I had a defined brand inside the company. And that's where really where I got to take on more and more. So probably in the uh, three to four years in, I started to manage people. Uh, and I learned that in the corporate environment, I was probably perhaps at the time not the best boss. And I learned a lot about you know managing that and got way better at it. But it was definitely a journey going through some, as you know, some great bosses or managers and some terrible ones. And uh, <laughs> you learn something from each, right? Um, and I'm sure some can be said about me during some of my career phases. What were some of those early leadership lessons that uh, you've recalled and perhaps still use today, Kevin? Uh, during my uh, theater career, I had a boss who was masterful. She had 10 children. So she wow. knew a lot about managing complexity. And what she was amazing at is knowing which battle to pick. So she didn't push back often, but what she when she did, you knew she was very serious. And that was a great kind of insight versus, you know, picking at everything. And then when I got to uh, my beginning of my corporate career, uh, you know, I think there were a couple of lessons. One, you don't often get really good feedback. You get a lot of um, generalized feedback. And so I think one of the big learnings of my corporate career was really around finding someone who would give you candid feedback in a way that was meant to help you develop versus just kind of titty tatty things, which I don't think were very helpful. I think once you found that path um, and people who would give you candid feedback, even if you didn't want to hear it, um, I found for me that that really began to help me better perform uh, and better kind of evolve in my career. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine. And uh, when you had people responsibility, were they folks that were about your same age, younger, older? How was that transition? They, yeah, they were always older than me. Yeah. Um, for about 10 years of my career, I was generally managing people that were at least 10 years older than me, uh, if not uh, longer. And, you know, I think at first it appears a daunting, but I think the, and when you talk about transitioning into inside coming into a new organization or transitioning from role to role it that transitions all about winning the right for someone to view you as their new manager their new leader right so it's, it's a you have a currency issue and so it's all about how do i come in be respect, respectful seek to understand and what you're really aiming for is what is that first thing i can do to make that team member's job a little bit better and if you can do that in you know a relatively short order you've won the license for someone to want to be like, okay, this person understands me, is taking me seriously. I want to be, I want to work with them further and better understand. But you have this very interesting window where you've got to demonstrate that. And sometimes people think it's a really large win. It's actually not. And in many of my experiences, the it's actually a much more of the subtle things about how people interact routines that actually matter most to them versus, well, I've got to deliver this really big initiative. That typically isn't the win in the early days. Right, right, right. And dealing with some of their personal issues can be a challenge as well, particularly given they're at a very later stage in life and, you know, maybe the age of your parents in some instances. Absolutely. You know, I think the if you're in the individual shoes, it's all about is this, does this other person understand where I'm coming from and are they are advocate for me um, in terms of my development. And and you will be more surprised than not that if you can demonstrate that, that you will see a whole different side of people. Um, I had a team member who had been with the organization for 30 years or close to 30 years and had never received a 360 review or wow. more formal feedback. Wow. And when they did, they were incredibly thankful. And within 90 days, people saw a difference. People wow. were stunned. 
Yeah. And my response was, how did we not do this? <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. right and, right. you know, so again, I think, it, you know, it doesn't mean there are going to be folks that don't live up to your expectation and you can be very humane and ethical about that while still running a, a sophisticated business. But you got to start with where are we today? So when I joined an organization, I tell everybody, everyone starts with a clean piece of paper. I will seek to understand the past, but I'm only going to evaluate on what I walk into and going forward because it's really easy to get dragged into, well, six years ago, Brant didn't do blank. I wasn't here. I don't know if that was because you had a poor leader or if it was for your own performance. And so that's kind of when you're changing roles inside an organization or coming into an organization, a lot of that energy is really trying to seek to figure out what's really going on. Yeah. I, you know, I remember uh, going into Procter & Gamble, which was my first employer and uh, worked for there for about eight, nine years. And I had a couple of bosses that, you know, would say, you know, I'm not even going to read your personal profile, you know, because your files would follow you just like any other corporation for probably mm -hmm. the same at Bank of America. And I thought that was a little bit odd, but you know, the more I thought about it, the more I like that because they weren't going to let someone else's, you know, coloring necessarily uh, make a change with regards to how they may think about that person coming in. Absolutely. So talk to us a little bit about this. And you mentioned this earlier, you know, we've, we've had mentors and we've also had tormentors in our past and not to name any names, Kevin, but, you know, maybe give us some examples of, of maybe observations of things that you saw in the past and people that either you worked for or you worked alongside and you said, wow, that's just something I wouldn't want to do. The example for, for example, of, you know, giving someone a performance review after 30 years. I mean, that's fabulous. Are there other types of things like that that you saw that, you know, you either say to yourself, boy, that's never going to be me or gosh, I'd really like to change that type of behavior within the organization? Yeah, you know, um, one I have this vivid memory on is uh, I work for an organization and while the intention was good around being very performance based, and I, I love metrics, and I love performance, but the culture turned into one, I used to describe the governance process as almost like someone throwing a piece of meat on the table and watching the jackals tackle the, the meat to eat it <laughs> in front of everybody. And it, I was early in my corporate career. It it was fearful. Like it, it, it honestly, like I would just, you know, you get super sweaty and stressed before going into these things. And on one hand, I learned a lot about, to your point, some of my most crucial learnings are about things that were done wrong. So on one hand, it's like, I think in the early part of your career, it's a little bit of that naivety around like, well, everything, it's not perfect and it should be perfect. And therefore, you know, everything would be better. But when I look back, a lot of my big learnings were when things were very unpleasant for me or very yeah. unpleasant for the people around me. Um, I worked, as you know, uh, when you work in the financial services world, there's also a fair amount of M&A that goes on and you see when it's done well or not. Um, and we, I was working on a transaction and it was not handled all that well. And I had an incredible boss and looked at me and he said, I was very upset about how something was handled. And he looked at me and said, don't waste your energy on it. What you should remember is if you're ever in this seat or at that table, how you would do it the right way. Hmm. And it literally stopped me like dead in my conversation and my fit of just massively being upset about what was being done. It was a great way to reframe it. And it was fantastic advice, which is you, you're not going to make you're not going to change the outcome. So move on. But remember this lesson for the rest of your life. And trust me, I will not forget that situation. <laughs> I imagine. So your banking career continued and we're going to get fast forward to Travis very soon because I want to hear about all the great things that are going on there. But uh, you moved around a lot. You know, I mean, you did that commute down to Florida. You went up to you know Chicago, I think, right from Charlotte after you finished with Bank of America over to Boston, I believe, Minneapolis, before coming out to California. Tell us a little bit about, you've lived almost every region in the U.S. and during your career. But did you encounter any kind of subcultural differences as you went around the country and, and worked in different financial, financial institutions uh, uh, in different parts of the country? Absolutely. So I think, you know, sometimes I get questions around the, the geographic mobility. You know, part of it is, Back to the kind of our earlier discussion is I once I got into my corporate career, I had a lot to learn, but I had a lot of good opportunities. Um, and for me, I prioritized for you know the first kind of major chunk of my corporate career, my career. And so 
I made the decision after six wonderful years with Bank of America that what I really wanted was a m smaller environment to really kind of stretch my wings and get to take on more. And so we, I moved to Chicago to take on kind of a, a role leading a, a, a meaningful business. It was an incredible experience um, and did a lot of cool things with them. And then ended up uh, being approached about a turnaround role for a troubled financial institution. That's how I ended up living in Boston. Um, and so, you know, what I found is the commonality was while the pace and the dialect and the directness would change from region to region, right? The South versus Chicago, which is very Midwestern to the East Coast, which is much more direct is the similarity was, is, you know, everybody wanted to come to work and be, you know, excited about their job or their employer, and they wanted to feel good and they, and they were willing to work really hard, but how they were treated was the kind of re the, the most resounding thing. And if they were treated well, they did incredible work. If they were treated poorly, you know, you had this kind of bias of, uh, you know, who left, who stayed around, and you know, you watch kind of the cultures change very, very quickly. Uh, sometimes for the good, sometimes really for the terrible. So, I always found the geographic differences to be very fascinating. I love that, you know, I, I've lived in a number of cities, Minneapolis, for a number of years. Um, each have incredible regions, you know, offered unique things. Yeah. People ask about, you know, you doing that as a career. It isn't for everybody, right? I took a lot of risk. So I think part of the career discussion for people is, is what are you comfortable with? I made a decision that for a number of years, I would really, really hunker down in my career. And I took a fair amount of risk a couple of different times. Um, and sometimes it worked out and sometimes it didn't. The thing that no one talks about is when you look at someone's resume, you look at my resume and you don't really see where there were huge not great moments or where you did something, took on a great opportunity that it didn't end the right way. And so that's a lot of what I think gets lost in translation as you look at people's careers and you're like, man, Brant just got there. He just was straight up. It's totally never the case. It's, there's always a really interesting story about kind of how you ended up where you did and and I'm no different. And the journey is the fun part of it, isn't it? Now it's, it's not always the destination. Absolutely. So you have made the corner office, obviously, almost coming up on two years now with uh, Travis Credit Union. Did you kind of have that in your sights as you, you know, progressed in your career? Because, you know, you had increasing levels of responsibility. You went from titles that included, you know, head of per certain divisions, managing directors, EVP, and then most recently, obviously, your 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 goal and or rather your achievement of, of president and CEO. W had that been in your sights for a while? I think earlier in my career, that was really the aspiration. Um, and then as I got more into my career, I think at times, yes, and at times, no. Um, I think part of it is do you, along your journey, you start to question, you know, what's important to me? What are the trade-offs? And then part of it is, is, you know, is that really still the end destination? And so for me, what became apparent a number of years ago is, Loved the work I did in the financial services space. And I predominantly worked on the side where you looked after consumer and small businesses. That means you're directly tied to the community. I love, like, really, really enjoyed that. So then the question for me is in the banking space, which goes through consolidation on a very regular basis. For me, I was beginning that phase of my life where I got married. Um, and then we, um, uh, we adopted a, our, our son who uh, we adopted him a year ago. Um, and so all of a sudden you go from what's my risk appetite to, hey, what is that next phase of my career and, my, and the journey for my family that aligns with my values of being focusing on kind of financial well-being, financial wellness, but in an environment that's supportive of a long-term journey. And so for a number of years, I've considered working for a credit union. It was really about being the right time and right place. Yeah. Now that you you know have uh, achieved that goal and on to more mm -hmm. in the future, how would you say your leadership style has evolved over time, looking back over the last 20 years? Yeah, I think there's really, you know, usually three distinct phases. There's the beginning part of your career and it's kind of figuring out how do you operate in a corporate environment or maybe it's a smaller environment coming to the nuances there. Then you take on the leadership of people. And with that phase becomes usually this interesting inflection point where you have to shift from I'm the expert in everything I do to I need to have domain competency, but really it's about leading people and about setting direction. And that is a very interesting curve to go through. And I don't, it took me a while to get there. And then the last thing is you become the CEO or the head, whatever, um, you know, now you're even, you're 
well, yes, you have the big seat and the title. The reality is, is that you're really the person kind of trying to organize indirectly some of the direction. So yes, by definition, ultimately you're accountable for the end outcome, but you're leading through people who lead through people who lead then ultimately to serve, in our case, members as a cooperative. It's a very different transition. Um, and what I will say for anybody in my peers who have taken on the role is the big shift for that thing is it's a lot more worrying about things that you don't directly control on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think your patience for how long things take gets shorter. That is the most common theme I hear from everybody who shifts from individual to manager to re leading a division like I did. And then one day, it's you. Yeah. It's not really me, but you're the spokesperson. You're the figurehead of the organization. And in my case, the way we run Travis is it's an inverted pyramid, right? So my job is to enable the team to ultimately serve the member. I just happen to be the spokesperson at time, but Travis isn't Kevin Miller. Travis is Travis. I just happen to be the CEO. And I think it's a big learning for people that you don't mix those, you don't confuse those two worlds. Sometimes CEOs want to be the company. And in this case, that's not the role. The role is we have a membership base, they're, they're owners of the organization through a cooperative. Our job is to basically provide for them, get them the right insight, right products and services to make them flourish. And if we do that, um, that's a great place to be. Well said, well said. You know, one of the things that the CEO really does is, of course, propagate the culture of the company. And, mm -hmm. of course, that's always hard coming in, particularly as the company's been established for a while and you've been there a couple of years. So a two-part question, what would you think at this stage best kind of describes the uniqueness or whatever might be unusual about uh, Travis? And and how do you propagate that? How, how do you ensure not only with the staff and the vendors and the folks that you work with, but, you know, with new people coming in, how do they understand what the culture is all about there? You know, it's interesting. Uh, so whenever I join an uh, organization, I do a, a numerous amount of kind of meet and greets. Uh, so I did in my first 30 days, I think 35 individual one-on-ones. And so my goal is to meet as many people as fast as possible. And I ask three questions. What's going well? What's not going well? And if I had a magic fairy wand and can change one thing about the organization, what would it be? <laughs> uh, and I write down all those notes and I anonymize all of them. And then I share that with my leadership team. Mm. So that alone tells you where to start. Yeah. So the interesting yeah. thing when I joined Travis is the resounding theme, even when there was opportunities for improvement, the number one piece of feedback is how proud they were to work for the organization and to support our members. It's really interesting. I've worked for a lot of, you know, publicly held organizations. And yes, there is some of that. And there are, don't get me wrong, amazing, amazing publicly held companies. Working for a credit union is very interesting because the passion about our involvement in the community, our members about doing the right thing uh, is like nothing I've ever experienced. And that to me was, it's if you think about places, Brent, you worked and I have worked, that's a really hard thing to create. And in this case, we're starting with it. So then it's really around how do we aim it? How do we refine it? How do we work through it? Um, and so for me, that was a really, really pleasant surprise um, and a lot of fun to start with. Yeah, awesome. And the second part of the question, how do you continue that conversation? How, do, how does culture get communicated outwards, particularly to new employees? Yeah, you know, so in our case, uh, much like many organizations, we've got incredibly tenured uh, team members at the organization, and we've got some new folks. And and really, part of the messaging is it's not about one versus the other. That is often when you have someone new come in, especially at the CEO or president level, there's this view of well, out with the old and with the new. And hmm. what my messaging is always about it is about the best of both. And the reason you want to mix is you want some outside perspective that come with a you know different set of experiences, but you can't forget the history. And the two together is really the most powerful team you can have. And I've seen that over and over again in my career. So the case of long tenured organizations, it's really around how do you respect the history, but also have frank conversations around where are we? Is it good enough? And what should we expect of ourselves going forward? And, and honestly, I think what the pandemic taught a lot of us, um, particularly me, because you know, we, it was an interesting time. I led, led the retail bank uh, for an organization. So we had a lot of team members in many states was, we called it kind of a cautious optimism, but it was a lot about being frank and transparent. It wasn't being overly rosy, but it was being like, look, there's better things to come. 
but we've got to be honest about where we are. And I find that for some people, it's a little bit more uncomfortable. Once you get people comfortable with that culture, then all of a sudden you're not you're not afraid or you're willing to push and challenge. So we have monthly town halls that are live over Zoom. Um, and my rule of thumb is you can ask any question as long as you ask it professionally. Right. There's nothing not on the table. Because with organizations, part of the challenge as you get bigger is you have to shrink them in terms of how they feel. And sometimes as you get bigger, I can think back on my career, there's a perception that the person at the top is all-knowing. Well, I am here to tell you, I am not all-knowing. <laughs> my job is to get the best team of people to enable the team, the full team, to do a great job. And so for me, I'm very always focused on making sure that people understand I am no, I have, yes, the title in the seat in the office, but I am no different than anybody else, right? I worry about what happens to my parents as they age. I have a, a special needs child that we adopted. You know, like life happens. It happens to everybody. And so I'm very focused on there isn't a difference. We have different seats. We have different experiences. But if you can't get that honest conversation, you never get to where you want to go. And so we're spending a lot of energy on getting people comfortable to that environment. Cool. What do you look for, Kevin, when you're making bets on the people you invest in and hire at Travis? Yep. So uh, kind of interrelated. Uh, first is when I start talking to candidates, all of them, uh, the way I do it to be respectful of their time and to mine is everyone starts with a 30 minute conversation. And I always start them with giving them context on the organization where we are in the journey. I believe in being very transparent. That's probably the first 10, 15 minutes. And then I have them talk to me about their experiences, how they fit into what I just said. Mm -hmm. And if that goes well, then it leads to an hour long conversation. Uh, and the logic is you're in an asymmetric situation when you're looking at talent. I know the most about the organization, you know the most about you. Anybody can read a job description. The challenge is always, how do I make my narrative or, or, or context or experience relevant to the organization? So I like to start with, here's what we are, here's what we're focused on, here's our journey and then talk to me about you. So if that goes well, then we have an hour long conversation where I really dig into experiences. So to answer your question, what I look for is domain knowledge. So do you understand the role we're looking, do you have enough experience in that domain? I then look at um, the type of operating environment we're going into, right? Is it a mature environment? Is it a turnaround? Is it a fix it? Is it a rapid growth? Do you, have to, do you have experience in that phase of things? And do you have experience across multiple phases? Um, and then I look at, you know, culture fit, experience leading people. So you got to have domain knowledge. You got to have expertise dealing with the environment we're going into, uh, ideally in multiple environments. Um, and, then, and then, you know, are you, in our case, our philosophy is you win as a team. So if you want to be the best individual contributor at the cost of somebody else, then, then you're not going to work a trap. Right. You got to, we got to win together. And so those are kind of those three elements I look at. When you get to that second 30 minutes and, you know, obviously things are going well, do you have a favorite interview question you ask everyone that kind of gives you a level of consistency across all the interviews you do? I don't. Um, so we start with the 30 minutes and then we move to an hour long. And really what I do is um, I look at, I look at the role um, and then I look at back to those kind of three kind of things that I look at. I'm really focused on getting clarity on those three items. So, you know, I might be great at, you know, managing this business line, but I've only ever done it in a very, very large, highly mature organization. So all of my questions are going to be about what scrappy situation have you been in when you've been stuck and you didn't have 25 resources? How were you able to get success? So I really try and tailor them to the situation. Um, and then, so if the hour long conversation goes well, then we bring them on site for an in-person meeting with the executive team. Cool. Well, Kevin, you've been very, very generous with your time, but we always have one last question. We always ask all our CEO guests, and that's what kind of career and life advice would you give to someone who maybe has their eyes on the corner office them, someday themselves? Absolutely. I think two things I would uh, depart with. First, uh, in your career, think about your career as a port. You're building a portfolio of skills. Um, and it was uh, in the early part of my career, this this came to me uh, through someone in one of the organizations I worked at. So if you look at my career, corporate career, I started in marketing. Then I did kind of cus customer segmentation. Then I moved into product management. And I thought about, I for me, intellectually, I thought about building out different sets of skills that were 
additive to each other. And over time, that made for me having a variety of experiences that maybe others didn't have. We have to tailor that based on your aspiration. But I think thinking of your career, not only in roles, but situations you get to work in, mature, not sure, fixing. Um, I think if you think about your career as a portfolio of skills, it enables you to think about taking on different opportunities that maybe on paper wouldn't have been your number one thing. And then second, it's a pretty honest conversation about what is it you really want in your career for this phase of your life, right? Because oftentimes there's conflict. You're at the phase of your life where you know, you're like, hey, I want that top job, but I also want more balance. It doesn't mean it's not possible, but oftentimes there, there's not a perfect equilibrium. And you're thinking about, you're flexing, um, and you do it, whether it's in your relationship or in your job, and you've got to think about where am I in life and how do I want to flex? And you need to be honest with your yourself about where are you in that journey? Um, because oftentimes there's a meaningful disconnect between the stated objective and then what you're willing to do. And that's often where there's the most amount of frustration. Yeah, terrific. Well said, well spoken. Kevin Miller, president and CEO of Travis Credit Union. Thank you so very much for sharing your journey into the corner office. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to Into the Corner Office with Brant Hanley. We hope you enjoyed hearing our guest CEO story as much as we did. If you want to hear more CEOs reveal their journey into the corner office, please subscribe via iTunes and tell your friends and colleagues. For more information about Brant, Resource Options International, and the mighty middle market, visit www.goforroi.com. We look forward to having you join us for our next episode.